Thank you very much for inviting me. I want to particularly thank Elaine Levin McGregor for uh, inviting me to participate. She's a uh, co-author of mine and um, a, a very, um, very much an expert on this topic. So I am excited to hear her um, perspective on the, the book and presentation. So this book came out of some of my previous work and research. I started off working at a refugee charity in London and went to grad school in New York um, to study the UN and migration. And my dissertation field work was looking at um, migrants arriving in Greece and Italy during the 2015, 16, 17 influx. Um, during that time period, the UN launched the New York Declaration in the middle of my fieldwork, and so I was speaking to many of the UN officials, uh, practitioners, government officials about the declarations and the compacts. Uh, my previous, um, there's, there's lots of previous research on, um, on global governance of migration, and um, usually it's produced either by the UN um, itself, um, specifically about the compact, so it's not very critical. Uh, some of it's published by NGOs, so it's also um, very critical, but without necessarily the historical uh, context or the political constraints. And finally, there's sort of a lack of understanding of what's actually in the compacts um, and what they're actually trying to do or say. So this book tries to fill that gap. The argument of the book, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce it. Uh, it. It briefly introduces the important concepts studying for studying global migration governance and places them within the historical context, including the New York Declaration. For example, in one chapter, I explore the negotiating strategies and the negotiating positions of different states during the, uh, the process, and then some of the backlash from governments in Europe. I then turn to the actual substance of the two compacts and show their contributions to global migration governance more generally and what's missing from that. So my main argument of the book is that the global compacts are the result of three shifts in global politics. First, from treaties to compacts. Second, from rights to aid. And third, from Cold War politics to nationalism. States have shifted from relying on treaties and hard law to preferring soft law, things like declarations and compacts, in part because they're perceived to be less binding than treaties and more flexible. States have also shifted from defining the rights of refugees and migrants to rallying voluntary support for more humanitarian aid. UNHCR, the supervisory body of the 1951 Refugee Convention, has become the most successful fundraiser within the UN system, often remaining silent on some of the most uh, egregious human rights violations from its biggest funders, the EU and the US. Finally, the compacts are part of a wider shift in politics uh, of the Cold War, in which the US and the Soviet Union saw refugees as important tools in their proxy wars, to the politics now of nationalism, in which governments are openly embracing xenophobic rhetoric and attacking human rights treaties. So consequently, the, the compacts only address one of the five major challenges in global migration governance, and that's coordination, and ignore the other challenges. And I'll go into those a bit more in the rest of my talk. So the outline of my talk is that I just told you the argument. I'm going to tell you some of the background, the challenges of global migration governance, the negotiations, uh, the compact of uh, on refugees and the compact for migration and the conclusion. This mirrors the argument of the book and many of the chapters. So it gives you a preview. But of course, the book goes deeper on many of these issues. And I'd love to engage with you more on any of the topics that might spark your interest. Uh, just generally as some context, global migration governments, when I talk about this, I mean the international laws, the norms, principles, and rules that govern migration policies. They're often made up of treaties and, and compacts. They can be court decisions, their norms and principles, or the rules of how the international institutions make decisions. These are the rules and institutions that influence states' behavior around migrants and refugees. And of course, they're not necessarily binding. They're not necessarily long-standing norms, and not necessarily all states participate in them. Although that's not necessarily what we mean by global governance. We hope that everyone participates in them. Uh, if we look historically, the 
background is that the refugee regime is thought of as being some of the most robust regimes. It has very much a hard law, the 1951 convention and the 1967 protocol. Um, the first country of asylum, uh, the, the norms of first country of asylum and spontaneous arrival uh, are pretty much well standing uh, norms, even though there's uh, variation in how they're implemented. And we know that durable solutions of resettlement, repatriation, and local integration are promoted by UNHCR. And that was uh, UNHCR as a norm entrepreneur using these as a way of disseminating a norm around the world. But we also, uh, migration scholars, think about the international migration regime as either non-existent at all or much less developed. Um, there are treaties and norms, but less states have signed on to the binding treaties and not as many policy areas have treaties. So I've, I've listed a few here, but in the book, I consider them next to each other. Why consider both the refugee and migration regime as part of global migration governance? So first off, the UN didn't, right? They put the compact for uh, the compact separately. Refugees have one, migrants have another, and try to silo different rights for migrants and refugees. I analyzed the refugee and migration regimes, regimes as subsets of global migration governance in order to compare the two approaches and see the similarities and differences. Um, it shows what and who are left out. Uh, while refugees have different rights, there are lots of overlaps as well. And importantly, no regime covers all forms of migration, so only uh, regimes cover certain policy areas. But all of the regimes combined, we have something that I think amounts to global migration governance. Taking a step back, I analyzed global migration governments generally and said, there are five major challenges here, right? Lack of capacity, lack of responsibility sharing, lack of access to protection, uh, lack of citizenship and lack of coordination. And let me just give you a little more detail on each of those. By lack of capacity, I mean that many states and international organizations don't have the standing capacity to uh, respond to large movements of people. Emergency responses often mobilize financial and human resources like border or asylum officers, doctors, humanitarian workers, in addition to things like tents or food and water and medical aid. Obviously, uh, not many states have all of this just sitting around. There has to be some way to mobilize that. Uh, the second, though, is a lack of responsibility sharing. Here, the global governance um, of migration doesn't have a formula for who will host or who will pay for refugees. Of course, there is one by default, but there isn't one sort of set in international law. Third is lack to, of access to protection. Many states in the global north are proud of their asylum systems. Um, maybe not proud, that might be overstepping a bit, but most refugees never actually gain access to that protection because the same states block them from traveling to those territories through carrier sanctions or others. Um, the, results is, the result is that, um, that northern states are legally required to provide protection for only a few asylum seekers who make it to their territory and voluntarily donate to those in the global south, right? This isn't uh, uh, responsibility sharing and it's actually blocking access to protection. The fourth er challenge is that there's lack of citizenship, meaning that migrants and refugees are often relegated to a second class status in which discrimination between citizens and non-citizens is legal. And many migrants and asylum seekers fall through the gaps of many social services only uh, accessible to citizens in addition to the legal protections guaranteed to citizens. And the fourth area is lack of coordination. This is what my dissertation and my uh, second book is mostly about is how actors coordinate aid in the field. And there are a plethora of different actors and stakeholders within global migration governance, but that can lead to incoherence and duplication or waste of resources. If we look historically, there are some recent initiatives on, all, on global migration governance, the Global Migration Group, the Global Forum on Migration and Development, and the Sustainable Development Goals had several key um, indicators specifically for migration. I'm not gonna go into those today because that's not the subject of the book. There's one chapter sort of laying that as the context, but I think it's more important to think about how those set us up for the negotiations and then what was in the actual compacts. So the negotiations start off with the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, which is adapted in September of 2016 at the New York Summit. It was there, it's really interesting to see all the actors celebrating this as an important moment, as many migrants and refugees were still arriving in Europe 
and of course, many displaced around the world. There's much more analysis of the New York Declaration than the compacts, so I'm going to focus more today on, my, on the compacts, but it's an important document that reaffirms many of the principles and rights uh, before. The declaration kicked off a two-year negotiation process. There was a separate negotiation for migration and one for um, uh, refugees, many different sort of preparatory meetings and consultations. And the book uh, lays out sort of a framework for understanding the, the negotiation strategies. I suggest that a conservative negotiation strategy is one which uh, states argue for fewer rights and fewer institutions, whereas an ambitious strategy were more rights and more institutions. So we have um, some um, European states pushing for more rights and more institutions. Uh, we have African states and Pacific Island states pushing for those, and more conservative states being US, and um, I mean, US actually didn't sign any of these, so they, they pulled out of that. Surprisingly, some states embrace new institutions, but use those institutions to advocate for restricted migration and to undermine rights. I call these restrictionist states that sought to use international cooperation to institute a norm of stronger border controls, restricted visas, and absolute, um, absolutist interpretation of sovereignty. Um, and I trace those sort of throughout the negotiations. Let's now turn to the global compacts and what they actually are. Uh, the global compacts, I say, are three things. First, they're non-binding cooperative frameworks. They bundle and reaffirm rights, and they lay out an architecture of global migration governance. By non-binding cooperative frameworks, the um, global compact for refugees states plainly, the global compact is not legally binding, right? It says it in the, the, the document. The uh, migration compact says, it's a non-legally binding cooperative framework. So we can see just in its declarative statements that it is not intended to be uh, binding. Although many, um, and, and of course there are no enforcement mechanisms there. They, uh, everything is voluntary. There are voluntary contributions and everything's uh, negotiated consensually. Um, the European Commission had uh, several um, illegal uh, uh, decisions decided to see if it was, and they said that the global compact of migration does not and does not intend to create any legal obligation under domestic or international law. Other states put in their sort of um, explanatory memorandums the same sort of idea. Secondly, though, the compacts were adapted through UN General Assembly res resolutions, which are not necessarily legally binding. While the General Assembly cannot force states to change their practices, it can require the UN system to follow new guidelines and participate in coordination networks and prioritize certain actions, which is what the compacts do. Um, others, like New Zealand, acknowledge that courts could look at the compact for guidance for interpreting norms, but that, that the compacts should not be decisive in their decisions. The second is that it's bundling and reaffirming rights. Both compacts bring together and reaffirm principles and rights from uh, dispersed agreements. Importantly, the drafters of the compact didn't want to create anything new. Instead, they drew on ideas that were already uh, committed in other documents. It's not really necessary for states to reaffirm rights because they have already committed to them, but it does show that they have not changed their positions. There are risks to this, of course, because the UN definitely did not think in 2016 that they would be negotiating the migration compact with Donald Trump in power. Second, it raises the profile and helps to coordinate disperse initiatives across the UN uh, system and regional institutions. And third, the compact uh, used issue linking, which as uh, part of the negotiation strategy. This means that both states in the global north and the global south get something out of the compacts. For example, the compacts reaffirm the right to control borders, but also reaffirm the right to claim asylum. This can make the document easier to sell to domestic audiences when a government is highlighting different parts of the compact directly that directly serve their own interests. The third thing that the compacts generally do are establish an architecture of global migration governance going into the future. And this is where much of the sort of governance will be built in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Here are all the new institutions and forms created through the compacts. Each is a new space for states to interact and decide um, 
how best to govern refugees and migrants. The new forums will be used to coordinate responses, set priorities, share best practices. I mean, quite literally, too, these are spaces where there will be negotiations for governance in the future to take place. One of the biggest challenges was that IOM was appointed the coordinator of the UN Network on Migration, which will be the central coordinating platform for UN activities on migration. This replaces the global migration group and hopes to be more um, have more coordination powers. In fact, the network is one of the main ways that the compact addresses the challenge of lack of coordination. Well, the UN, uh, sorry, why, well, IOM only joined the UN in 2016. IOM was quite territorial during the negotiations, pushing hard for the leadership position in this role. One of the ideas that I traced throughout the book is that the compacts are the first step in a long process of institutionalizing or crystallizing new norms around migration. The General Assembly resolutions are one of those first steps that are flexible and got broad support. But these new forums are ways of institutionalizing regular interaction between states. And they also hope that the process of negotiating the compacts and establishing the architecture means that states will be socialized into these new ideas and uh, norms. So now we can turn to the compact on, migra uh, on refugees. I identify um, four different main contributions. I don't have time to go into all of those, but I'm gonna highlight um, a few of them. Uh, First is refugee self-reliance and livelihoods. Now, this is not the first time UNHCR has introduced this idea, but it's the largest and biggest endorsement, globally endorsed. Um, of course, self-reliance has been sort of a, a background issue for a while within refugee protection, but it includes ideas like um, entrepreneurship training, microfinance loans, subsistence farming, vocational training, and employment matching schemes. And they hope to be integrated into local economies, but this again is focusing on um, is not focusing on rights or aid, but transforming refugees into economic actors, which is a big change from the 1951 convention. It justifies cuts in aid and ignores the non-economic components of self-reliance. The second area I want to highlight from the compacts is about resettlement and complementary pathways. UN Secretary General um, uh, Ban Ki-moon had pushed for a goal of resettling 10% of the world's refugee population uh, to include that in the compact. But instead, the compact asked for a more efficient refugee resettlement program and expanded pathways, uh, nowhere near a 10% commitment. Complementary pathways are the idea of having safe and regular avenues for refugees that complement resettlement by providing lawful stay in a third country where their protection needs are met. Now that's fine, it's, it's something like humanitarian visas, or humanitarian admission, community sponsorship, family reunifications, things for like opportunities for employment or, or education. Key is that they're supposed to complement and not replace durable solutions. Again, this is an aid response that is not rights-based. Um, many of the ways of achieving the compact on the Global Compact on Refugees is through voluntary contributions. UNHCR will cajole states to voluntarily expand these complementary pathways, and they'll use the Global Refugee Forum to pressure states to make more tangible pledges, but all are voluntary. Of course, this doesn't help with the responsibility sharing idea because none of it is mandatory. Now, there's a lot missing from the compacts. I'm just gonna highlight one here is, of course, the criteria for responsibility sharing. Hosts must request to activate the uh, support platform, which means that at the beginning of each crisis, they will be squabbling over who will pay for what and um, if the situation is bad enough for a, a sort of international response. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of these as well in, in our discussions, but I um, highlight in the book that these are really missing from the compact. Now, if we turn to the, the Compact for Migration, uh, this had 23 objectives with commitments. Of course, these are commitments. They're, they're not legally binding commitments, but are signaling an intent, right? I'm gonna highlight again, just two of these, which were uh, key. First, the Compact affirms the seemingly non-controversial statement that migrants have human rights. Migrants are not being added to international human rights law. Rather, migrants are protected under human rights law because human rights apply universally to everyone. The compacts state this, that 
and all migrants everywhere are recognized as persons before the law, requiring due process and independent judiciary review. Um, the compact also references a principle of non-discrimination and the principle of non-regression of human rights. However, I identify several points where the compact undermines current standards, um, such as it limits the freedom of migrant children by encouraging states to seek alternatives to detention for children, which undermines the complete prohibition of child detention in the 19 1989 uh, Child Rights uh, Treaty Convention. The compact also does not explicitly guarantee that migrants will be detained separately from criminals, which undermines the detention standards in the 1966 um, ICCPR. Uh, and finally, the compact does not guarantee access to sexual or reproductive health for migrants, um, which undermines the 1987 UN Committee on Eliminating Discrimination Against Women's recommendations. So there are multiple points where the compacts actually have a lower standard from what is best practice. The second main contribution uh, from the Migration Compact is that it claims that it does not introduce new norms and rights for migrants, yet the compact frames several compacts in innovative ways that could be interpreted as early stages of the life uh, cycle of a norm. Here, I'm talking about the concept of state responsibility for a safe and orderly and regular migration. The compact asserts that states are responsible for controlling their borders, regulating legal pathways for migration, registering their population, protecting the labor rights, organizing detention and deportation, all within the rule of law. Now we know by practice, many states aren't doing this, but it could be quite a step to ask states to do this within the rule of law. The compact asserts, um, sorry, that this builds on the ideas of well-managed migration policies in the SDGs and the New York Declaration. It's not a violation of sovereignty, of course, because it's actually an assertion of sovereignty that states have the right to control their borders, but responsibility to make them safe and within the law. In some ways, this was a win for restrictionist states seeking to use the compact to affirm their practices and win, and it's also a win for human rights activists hoping to subject migrant uh, policies to rule of law. Of course, the Migration Compact also had a lot missing. Um, I've got them here again. I'm happy to talk about each one, but um, just to highlight a few. The first is that the detention of uh, child migrants. Um, the Migration Compact undermines international standards because it allows detention of child migrants in the last resort instead of outright banning of child detention. We also see the principle of non-refoulement um, not clearly applied to vulnerable migrants. In Objective 21, uh, it commits states to a safe and dignified, dignified return, but it introduces a new standard in which upholding the prohibition of collective uh, expulsions of return of migrants when there is real and foreseeable risk of death, torture, and other cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment. Um, in accordance with other obligations. Now, the, uh, the migration compact's wording of real and foreseeable risk differs from the Convention on Torture's wording prohibiting refoulement on substantial grounds for believing someone is at risk of torture and other human rights violations. So courts are going to have to decide which standard they want to interpret. And I'd like to point out that the 1966 uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects everyone from reform law, not just refugees. So um, some states were really clear, China, Russia, that they didn't want the principle of non refoulement applied to migrants. But if we look at other international human rights law, this is not the case. Right? So in conclusion, uh, I want to return to the threads that run throughout the book. Those are that while the compacts are major achievements for global migration governance, their format and content, content are the result of three shifts uh, from hard to soft law, from rights to aid, and from the politics of Cold War to those of nationalism. Global migration governance has five large challenges. The ones that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the lack of capacity, uh, responsibility sharing, access to protection, citizenship and coordination. And the negotiations were a once in a generation opportunity, I think, to address these head on. However, the compacts only address the lack of coordination by creating this UN network on migration and a plethora of other institutions for coordination and best practice sharing. I view these um, 
as the first steps in building a more robust and inclusive uh, global migration governance within the UN. And um, it, it, it is a note of optimism and one of skepticism as well. So I'm really excited about the conversation we're gonna have today and looking forward to questions and comments. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. So um, yeah, we have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, so please go ahead. If you have a question, you may uh, use the raise uh, my hand button, or you can also unmute yourself right in the chat box or however you like. Maybe I can kick us off. Yeah. So thanks so much for the for the presentation. Really interesting. Um, so you've kind of brought us up to where we are now current day. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in a global pandemic. We've also seen a lot of things change with regard to just global mobility in general now. Um, where do you see us going in the future with regard to global migration governance? What are your predictions? Just to throw an easy question out there. That's, you know, that's a, the it's very interesting. Okay, so in the conclusion of the book, I, um, I lay out four sort of fundamental reforms that I think we could pursue in the future. Just because, um, and, and they mirror the, the challenges at the beginning, the idea of like lack of citizenship or the idea of lack of capacity. And the idea is that these, these challenges aren't impossible to solve, right? We, we, we know how to solve them. Actually, as migration scholars, we've been talking about the solutions for a long time. The problem is that political will won't get us to this, right? And that is something that hasn't shifted much since then. I mean, it was a big shift from Cold War politics to nationalism, but those politics haven't shifted much. Uh, having Biden in office doesn't mean that he's straight away signing up for the migration compact, right? Actually, that is a big question mark here is, will the US actually join the, the compacts? I mean, in principle, he could, and he's often mirroring the same language of safe, orderly, and humane um, uh, migration policies. Biden uses that phrase all the time, which is strikingly similar to the UN's um, language. But I don't see a huge push within the administration to sign the compacts. In fact, that might actually hurt the sort of domestic legislation in the US uh, trying to get citizenship laws passed. Um, so I, I guess I, I will just go through a few of those reforms and, and say that I, I don't think that they are the key, like I don't think the UN is uh, very excited to hold up a, a compact 2.0, right? There's not really political energy for that. Right now, the energy is for implementing the compacts as is, right? And there are a lot of implementation mechanisms that are gonna happen over and over again. So things like um, national, um, national implementation plans for both the global compact and like the pledging mechanisms for the refugee um, uh, compact. Uh, we also have regular review forms. So the, we had regional reviews this last year, which happened all digitally, which I think kind of was a good thing because people really participated in that. Um, the uh, next year will be our first international migration uh, review forum, which will be a chance to reflect on, okay, four years later, how far have we come? Um, the real trick will be if there are any real accountability mechanisms here. I mean, um, most of these participants, many of the reviews are just voluntary. And this isn't like the Human Rights Council where uh, states have to be reviewed. This is a voluntary review mechanism. So there'll be a lot of bragging going on. Um, and I think that's a, a huge question is how civil society and other like special rapporteurs can hold states accountable for practices that aren't, I mean, just aren't up to standard for the compact. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, so, so, um, I guess some of the things I, I address in the book, one is um, the idea of capacity. Um, where do we get a standing capacity for uh, responding to migration crises? Um, UNHCR has a lot of capacity already, but do we want to be subcontracting migration capacity to UNHCR? Maybe states do, maybe they don't, but they haven't actually agreed to that yet. They agreed to temporary support platforms that are activated every once in a while. Um, and it doesn't quite solve the problem of having capacity to do that. I think that there, there is scope for going that direction, but maybe 
um, maybe more regionally. I think uh, this last week where the EU agreed to actually create the uh, upgrade the European Asylum Support Office to a full agency could be a sign that regionally there is um, scope for standing capacity. Um, the other area is about responsibility sharing and how do we create a global responsibility sharing. Um, there is default responsibility sharing. Right now, states that are neighbors to refugee producing countries are the ones who share most of the burden, right? And states in the global north voluntarily pledge aid. And the global compacts affirm that structure. They don't undermine that structure. They actually create more forums for global uh, states in the global north to pledge more aid, right? And the hope is that they will pledge more aid. Well, the first question is, it's not clear necessarily that they will pledge more aid. Um, and why is that the the way is that the formula that we want to share? Is it, does it not mean that um, that states need to be resettling more people? Um, I think resettlement has become and has been shown in the last few years under the Trump administration after it was cut so drastically that it's really just a surface level level policy right now. To to have ten percent of the refugee population resettled is astronomically more than what we're even doing right now. So I, I think that scaling up that is a huge, huge issue. Um, I'll leave it there and maybe we'll come back to other, other questions. Thanks. So there's a question from Mohammed on the chat box. Uh, and please Mohammed, um, uh, correct me if, um, there, if I ask your question incorrectly, but he, he wrote in cases of uh, state fragility or failure, to who the responsibility to protect migrants fall to? For example, the case of Yemen or Libya. Mm. This is such an interesting question because it is uh, the intersection of responsibility to protect and the global migration regime. Uh, responsibility to protect, of course, is the um, idea from the early 2000s. It became uh, a, a part of, I think it was the World Summit Outcome Documents so or International Law, that states have a responsibility to intervene in a state when the state that is, um, is supposed to be providing protection doesn't, uh, isn't able to provide that. And um, the UN has mechanisms for um, protecting, uh, maybe sending in humanitarian missions and otherwise. Um, Oftentimes we think of the, this um, situation as um, internally displaced people, right? Because they haven't crossed the border yet, there's still the responsibility for the state that their uh, territory that they're in. But your question points to what happens when the government just can't provide any of that protection. Okay, now uh, I will tell you the global compacts don't solve this problem. Their approach, instead of intervening with outside actors, is to build the capacity of states. And so all of the mechanisms that I presented about or showed are about building the capacity of states to help migrants um, or refugees, right? So it means funneling more aid through state agencies. It means um, UNHCR having the asylum support um, uh, mechanism, which will hopefully be able to build the capacity of um, Yemen or Libya's asylum systems. Now, in reality, that's not going to do much, right? I mean, we don't expect Libya to have a very rigorous asylum system. What we do expect then is that there'll be a subcontracting of aid to UNHCR or IOM to provide to them. And that um, that is in the, the compacts in, um, in some ways, but it's not, um, there's not like a straight path forward for an easy way to helping and protecting these vulnerable migrants. Um, the other thing I would like to point to is that um, the Global Compact on Migration uh, puts out a new phrase, voluntary migrants, right? This is not necessarily new, of course, migration scholars, we think about this as well. It's sort of the gray zone between economic migrants and refugees, people who don't necessarily qualify for the 1951 Refugee Convention definition, but still shouldn't be sent back because they're vulnerable. And the Compact on Migration um, has some very important things uh, laid out for it, ideas of providing aid and how, um, how migrants should be uh, protected in certain ways. What I point out in the book, though, is that these are all voluntary and aid. They're not providing rights for uh, vulnerable migrants. Um, and there is real scope for expanding the idea of the principle of non refoulement being applied to vulnerable migrants, even though states, many states, were pushing back on that idea. Um, 
I, I see that as a, as a real important path forward. The, um, just to circle back to R2P and the responsibility to protect, um, the compacts essentially affirm the state's responsibility for managing migration. Okay? So in the, in, in the uh, situation of state failure in Yemen or Libya, the idea is not that humanitarian actors would intervene and, um, and provide the aid directly, it's that they would build the capacity of the state to then provide the aid in the long term. Right? And I think that is a shift from the early 2000s, thinking about R2P as a real responsibility, and um, now a sort of more absolutist interpretation of sovereignty. Right? Not sovereignty as responsibility, but sovereignty as the state's uh, primary provider of aid to migrants. Uh, there's also another question from Francesco. Uh, Francesco, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it? It's in the um, I see it, yeah. So where do the five challenges come from in the book? Um, they are my categorization. They're sort of, uh, they do come from the literature review, thinking about how to organize where the holes in protection are and how it developed over time. Um, and so it, it was a, a, a general analysis of it. They also mirror sort of the ways in which um, states have tried to reform the, uh, the global migration regime. So um, I highlight in the book that these challenges emerged during the negotiations again and again because they're long-standing challenges right lack of citizenship is a long-standing challenge that um, has been addressed in many different ways statelessness refugee status um, temporary protect like there are many ways of, of thinking about citizenship and so it appeared oftentimes in uh, negotiations uh, again and again in a similar way uh, others did to access to protection and um, lack of capacity otherwise I also see another question from Lena uh, and a hand somewhere oh, from Elaine. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, Lena, would you like to ask your question or should I perhaps read it? Uh, yeah, uh, her mic is not working, so I'll just read it. She's just asking, um, so yeah. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for this very interesting presentation. I would like to hear your opinion on why several parliaments pushed on voting on the GCM, even though it's non-binding. Hmm. This is a really important question and um, it's uh, central to my chapter three of the negotiations and how it evolved. Um, I think the also key to this question is why did the migration compact have backlash? And why didn't the refugee compact have a backlash? So let's think about that first. Why did the refugee compact, it was sort of uncontroversial. Well, the first is the way in which it was negotiated. It was negotiated UNHCR taking the lead as sort of consultations, drafting it, um, and then states having input, obviously. It was passed through an omnibus bill by UNHCR sort of annual uh, omnibus bill. Several states objected, Hungary and uh, the United States, but otherwise it was pretty much uncontroversial. And I link that in the book to um, the, the long-standing refugee regime in which uh, most states have signed on to the 1951 convention, 1967 protocols, and doesn't feel controversial to reaffirm those. Um, in addition, UNHCR didn't like have a big ceremony or like throw out lots of um, uh, uh, um, uh, press conferences about it. It was very much below the radar. And so it didn't attract attention because of that, I think. Um, instead though, the, the migration compact was different. It was uh, negotiated and led by the states. Um, it, they had several co-facilitators, um, uh, Switzerland and Mexico leading the negotiations. Um, then uh, it held, once it was agreed, a gigantic summit in Morocco um, in the same way that a treaty would. So it looked much more like a treaty um, at that point. And if we reflect on the fact that migration doesn't have as long standing or as, um, as rigorous of a regime, it felt like a bigger step to have a, a all encompassing compact. Right? Um, and the backlash was real, right? There was an online campaign from some activists in the far right suggesting that the compact had a right to migrate inside of it. 
uh, many states took up that language and, and argued that the uh, compact was suggesting that there was a right to migrate. Um, the negotiators and um, special representative uh, Luis Arbor um, pushed back on this very uh, strongly, saying that there's absolutely nothing in here that infringes on sovereignty of a country or on uh, or suggests even closely to the rights uh, to migrate. But even still, it, it didn't matter because uh, both the online campaign and the political far right saw this as an easy punching bag. And I think symbolically, it was um, it looked more like a, a treaty as well, even though it parallels the, the, the refugee compact. Um, I, I think that is one of the, the main main reasons. Um, I also think we see a, a major shift then. Uh, this, this is what the third point in the, the book is, that the shift from Cold War politics to nationalism is that nationalism um, can take hold in many ways in different types of countries. And in uh, Europe, let's think of um, Belgium as a, a good case. I mean, Switzerland still hasn't signed it as well. Um, they had negotiated a, a compact and then weren't allowed to sign it. So the ambassadors in 2016 and otherwise, everyone was really gung ho for this compact and ready to do it. And the last two or three weeks fell apart. So um, very frustrating and hard, but I, I will say that the implementation since then has gained momentum and doesn't really have as much resistance, right? Um, I think the reason Biden hasn't signed it isn't necessarily because of the same um, the same sort of toxic uh, idea of a right to migrate. I think it's more about his hope to get the uh, immigration bill passed in the US. Thank you for the answer. Elaine, you can go ahead. Thank you very well. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see you and thanks for joining. Uh, it was a really interesting presentation and uh, really enjoyed your book. Um, I have a question that um takes yeah takes us a little bit back in the negotiations um because i think what's quite interesting when you look at the kind of early conversations the it, we didn't talk about compacts we talked about a compact so one singular and it was about a very specific issue um and then you see this kind of proliferation of different things happening uh, different actors with different interests i think part of that interest is the the whole institutionalization of migration within the un clearly as you've said uh, but you also had for example obama with his separate summit on the sidelines and i'm just curious as to uh, from some of the interviews you've done the conversations you've had um whether uh, firstly you've had any kind of insights into maybe some other kind of yeah maybe coalitions of actors that have contributed to that separation and i think that relates to a much longer discussion about the separation between refugees and migrants and the different negotiation processes um and my question there is, is do you think we're going in the wrong direction um, do you think that actually what we've done with the GCM and the GCR is legitimize something that's ultimately and fundamentally not working and is actually something that's really serving interests of those organizations reliant on, for example, earmarked funding, which is now very nicely programmed through the, the GCM? Yeah. Uh Really, you raise so many interesting questions here. Um, I want to. Uh, I have strong opinions about the Obama summit, um, so I'm going to start there. Uh, Obama held um, a leadership summit the day after I think the uh, UN declaration was signed, and it was supposed to be a pay for play. Uh, summit, meaning that if you wanted to attend and get to shake Obama's hand, you had to make new pledges and new aid amounts. Um, and they did. Um, actually, the star of the summit was the Ethiopian government who pledged major reforms, same government that is now leading the, the, the war effort. Um, uh, so I think there's really interesting questions about um, if the summit was actually effective. My criticism of it is that I think it splintered the UN's approach, which was to get, I mean, the whole point of the UN was to have, uh, of the global compacts and the declaration was to have one unified voice of everyone together to establish this sort of foundation of it. And then the architecture afterwards for the next 20, 30 years will be where we build these spaces. And then the day after Obama held a separate forum where it's a different, like 
the unified message was just totally undermined there. Um, part of that was because Obama um, thinks he has special negotiating power and Biden also does. He thinks that strong arming countries will do more than something that the UN can do. Um, it's not clear if that actually works. And we see now that if um, a ally like the US um, actually, like if Obama's the Democrats lose and Trump came to power, that strategy doesn't work anymore, right? Actually, you should have been relying on the UN the whole entire time. Um, now to the, the question about different coalitions. Um, so I think the first thing we need to point out during the negotiation strategy is that the UNHCR took a fundamentally conservative approach to the compact, right? They did not want to open up discussion of the definition of what a refugee was. They wanted to fundamentally conserve the structure of the regime and expand ways of funding what the regime actually is, right? Nothing else. They didn't want to renegotiate anything or try to uh, rebalance something else. It was literally just to find new ways of fundraising. I, I'm sure that UNHCR won't like that characterization, but if you look at the outcome of it. That's really what's in the document. Um, and the title of the compact when it was first started to be negotiated was it was supposed to be the Global Compact on Responsibility Sharing for Refugees. Now, they dropped the responsibility sharing in the end title because it's kind of embarrassing that there are no responsibility sharing mechanisms in the actual compact afterwards. Um, so that would, I, I think that's the first thing. UNHCR really set the tone and the, the bar for the Compact for Refugees quite low. Um, the migration side, um, it does fundamentally create a dichotomy, right? Rights for refugees, aid for migrants. Vulnerable migrants don't fit a refugee category and, and sort of solidifies that as a negotiation path um, in two compacts. And then in different forums for now, what? 50 years, we're going to be negotiating them in different spaces. The refugee stuff happens in the Global Refugee Forum, and the migration stuff happens in the uh, migration forums. I don't think that's necessarily a good approach. Right? We know that there are so many overlapping issues. So one of the things I highlight is the vulnerability of um, LGBTQ plus migrants and refugees. In both compacts, they're completely left out. There's not a mention, a reference, anything. Now, there's a lot to be learned from both sides there. And there's overlapping um, vulnerabilities, and yet it's it's totally out of the whole forum. And um, and if they'd been in the same space, maybe the actors could actually cooperate together. Another area for this would be climate um, uh, induced um, displacement. Should it be in the refugee compact or should it be in the migration compact? The refugee compact has one reference to uh, climate being in displacement. It, there's more of it in the, the migration compact. Actually, I think it's a, a significant progress in the migration compact that climate induced migrants are uh, recognized because of slow and sudden onset um, changes in the environment. And the uh, migration compact suggests that we should use development aid to do climate adaptation in countries of origin. Now that's a new thing in the, in the, climate, in, in the migration regime saying that as the priority is a, is a big step. Um, but why create this false dichotomy? I mean, of course, we know that climate uh, displaced people are not in the refugee definition, but there's clearly some forced displacement happening here, right? So having them separate is really a hard, hard space. Um, I'm not sure if I got all of your interesting questions, but I'm happy to talk more. Um, thank you. I do see there's another question, but I'm going to abuse having the mic for just a second. Um, so I think um, part of the issue is, is that the New York Declaration conceptualized rights for migrants, rights for refugees, and rights for migrants and refugees. But that was then not carried on into the compact negotiations, and that kind of just fell through the cracks. So then I suppose there's an argument to be made for a global compact for migrants and refugees. or as I would prefer to say, migrants, including refugees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, we agree on that conceptualization. Migration is the largest category and refugee is one uh, subcategory. Absolutely. Yeah. I will say so. It, one of the one of the boxes in my in the book is uh, laying out exactly that: the rights to migrants, the rights to refugees, and then the whatever for both. But I have a, a fourth category, which are the non-commitments to both, which um, you'll see in in the declaration. They use uh, very soft language, like we encourage, we recommend, we suggest, 
And when they're talking about rights for refugees, they're always like, you must, you should. This is like a, a much stronger language. When they talk for migrants, it's almost always non-committal language. We recommend you consider signing the Migrant Workers Convention, right? Like very soft language. And, and it's a, a, a huge difference in, in the way they talk about it. Um, although I will say using the word commitment in the Global Conflict for Migration was a big win, right? Having that as one of the key phrases again and again and again um, sort of ups the, the political commitment there, even if it's not a legal commitment. Perhaps if there's still time, I'll ask a follow up to that, but I see uh, that Paddy has a question and has turned the camera on, so I'll uh, pass sure. the mic. That's okay. I, I try to be. I try to be quick. Um, Nicholas, thank you for uh, for the for the for the presentation and apologies. I came in late, but I think I caught uh, part of your um, uh, you know presentation of some of the aspects that will be in the book. And you know, I was nodding my head, thinking about how you know the Global Compact for Migration indeed had a very interesting process. But I also think that it was also not quite organic. Um, uh, I was present in 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 some of these deliberations in some in some countries are not you know I, I probably shouldn't sort of mention too much and I didn't think it was a very organic process and why do I say this I say this because it was not really government led it was very much international organizations led but you know uh, sometimes it's about having convening power and it's sort of not you know uh, to build the appetite and so I also think what has happened with the global compact is that even though it you know it got the signatures that were very important unfortunate that others didn't sign on what it has meant is that when it came back home it still needed a lot of socialization and I'm wondering actually also in terms of, you know, also looking a little bit back and speaking to people who have been part of these processes, sort of also pre-national processes uh, to the Global Compact for Migration that felt that there was a lot that was very much a global north push and not so much of a global south. And then I'm not very surprised, right? If I think about the national processes that it didn't really also evolve at the national level. And that has also meant that when it comes back to implementation, it doesn't have so much favor. Actually, you need to reorient, you need to re-socialize people. And I'm sort of wondering, I know I've asked you a different question also in, in there, you know, so how do you see this balance and where are we moving forward? That we're also not just moving the agenda of the global north. I don't really like these phrases though, global north, global south, but I have nothing else to use. So you know, pushing the agendas for the global south. How do you see this as having come out? And what opportunities do we have looking forward, especially for the Global Compact for Migration, which is right now in the review process, but also how it ties back to the local. And by the local, I mean involvement of the mayors, involvement of the municipalities, the urban spaces where migrants, refugees, IDPs would actually be taking space so that you see whatever objective has been set out is what you see being implemented. I hope I was not too quick, but short enough. It's a lovely question. I, I'm really happy you asked it. Um, so just my interpretation of the negotiations was that um, the Global Compact for Refugee was very UNHCR led um, and the Global Compact was more state led. I'd love to hear, uh, maybe we can discuss afterwards too, if you think it was more IO led, but um, the, 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 the debates, what was in the content of the, um, of the compact, the zero draft, and then the drafts that came afterwards were all state written. And to be honest, the things that were submitted by international organizations like um, UN Women and um, uh, uh, other agencies, none of their stuff got in, right? They were very critical of, the, of it and like went line by line and said, we should change this here and this here. And that didn't really change. Whereas the restrictionist stuff from states changed. Um, and so that's why I interpret the Global Compact for Migration being more state-led and being quite influenced by it. And I think you are right in that the Global North got most of what they were asking for. The, the, the main contribution, this idea of state responsibility for safe um, and orderly migration is an affirmation that states are allowed to control their borders. Right? States are allowed to detain migrants. The states are allowed to check passports. The states are allowed to deport. Right? That is an affirmation of that. Um, now, the human rights angle of that is that it has to be within the law. Right? It has to follow rule of law. And that, I think, is somewhat of a win to say that migrants have to be able to have uh, legal papers and that you can't deport someone without these. And like, those are important as well. But the states that are um, looking to have more restrictionist policies wanted an affirmation of those things. And so Obama or others could say, look, 
we're doing child detention at the last resort, right? Now, that's not our current standard, right? It should be a prohibition of child detention. And yet the declaration sort of says, well, it's the best practice. That's lowering our, our current, um, current standard. Um, so I, I'm, uh, I am optimistic in that we have set an agenda for the next 20, 30, 40 years of engaging. And I am very sort of proud of civil society actors, like they are strongly engaged and hopefully will be continue to engage in these spaces. Um, but we can be pessimistic as well. There has been like, this is not a perfect document. And we know that the Global North defined a lot of the, the key things here. So thank you for that question. I'm, I think you highlighted a really important dynamic there. Um, I see another hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I just had a question on your idea that the language lowers the barrier in a lot of the international treaties because the people that will follow the international treaties follow the international treaties. However, we see in a lot of countries that these treaties are being ignored, I mean, it's rare that some countries haven't ratified a numerous um, human rights treaty. So actually, I understand that it, it minimizes the idea that it's an absolute prohibition, but how do you then relate to the fact that actually it's being ignored as an absolute prohibition? Maybe this will motivate some states to actually go, well, it's an absolute last resort, we'll try and avoid it. Mm. I mean, this is a problem with all international law. What enforcement mechanisms do we have, right? Some um, treaties have stronger enforcement me mechanisms where you can take someone to court. Um, the compacts definitely don't have that. Um, it's, it's symbolic. And I think symbolically not being able to name and shame countries because of this is, is important, right? It means that in the International Migration Review Forum next year, that we're not going to criticize the US for child detention as strongly because it's only as a last resort, right? That's the, the thing. It sets us up for a bar that then you can criticize people for or hold them accountable for. It's another form of accountability, even if there aren't necessarily repercussions. Um, it is also about the slow socialization of states into accepting this as a norm, right? And a step backwards is always a step backwards, I think. Um, we should be holding people, uh, states up to the idea of non-regression. You can't roll back rights after you've agreed to them. Um, there is, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's soft law. Can soft law undermine hard law? That's an important theoretical question that is unclear. Right? Uh, theoretically, nothing should be able to undermine hard law unless a state actually takes itself out of that treaty, right? In practice though, soft law often indicates that a state is changing its behavior and may never pull out of a hard law treaty even though it is changing its behavior. So in the process of negotiating though, we human rights activists, scholars, other states that are more pro-migrant rights can hold those same states that want to lower the bar more accountable, right? The process of negotiating is a socialization process. And I think that's important. The UN built a lot of new knowledge in the process of negotiating. I mean, reports created, they set new standards for collecting statistics. I think this is going to impact a lot of how we think in the future. Um, I, I, I think, um, let me just use another example that might be interesting. Um, during the early drafts of the Global Compact for Migration, there was language about uh, privacy firewalls, right? That there should be a privacy firewall between immigration agencies and social services so that you couldn't use welfare benefits to help track migrants and deport them, right? And they used best practices. States were sh um, showing how they used it in certain countries and it was very successful. And the language was in the early drafts, but got very clearly negotiated out by the end. But in the process, um, states and experts submitted lots of information. It became a, a debate that was really active. And I think um, future space for that as a debate, it's not gonna just disappear. Even though it wasn't in the compact, the process of negotiating helped create knowledge and some momentum for it that I hope there's ground for in the future. Right. Um, it's a similar thing, even though it's going the other way. Right. The step down for child detention. Um, thank you for the question. It's really, really interesting. 
Thank you very much all for your uh, questions. And um, yeah, well, we're right on time to wrap up this seminar. Uh, so thank you all for being part of this uh, academic year. And it was a pleasure to host, uh, to, to have you all attend the seminars. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nicola, for your presentation. And yeah, this will be the last uh, seminar. We, we do not have seminars for July and August. And um, however, we're going to start again the seminars in September. And I'm going to be really looking forward to seeing uh, perhaps all of you again. Wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Bye -bye. Please feel free to follow up with the email as well. Yes, and I'll share with you the, the YouTube uh, link once it's out. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.